This is King World News. I'm Eric King, and you're about to hear an interview with James Turk of goldmoney.com. Remember to go to our homepage at www.kingworldnews.com for more interviews this week with part two of John Malden's interview, as well as global head of currency strategy Mark Chandler, whose firm moves about $600 billion a month in the currency markets. Joining us now is James Turk, founder and chairman of goldmoney.com and co-author of The Collapse of the Dollar with John Rubino. James, you commented about the chart formation of gold and went on to say in your July 26 piece, quote, this pattern is telling us that the decline in gold last year after the Lehman collapse was a classic selling climax. Gold was dumped in the rush by hedge funds and others to deleverage. That selling led to a bottom that was marked by emotion, not logic. It has been my view that gold will climb above $1,000 this year and stay there. I thought it would happen in the first quarter, and while gold did reach $1,000, it failed to stay there. The next time I expect there will be a different result. Gold will hurdle $1,000 and keep climbing. That moment is rapidly approaching, end quote. Where do you see gold heading when it does take out the previous high on this leg? Where, where do you think it could shoot to before it has a, some corrective action, James? Yeah, you know, my guess is it's probably going to go to fourteen, fifteen hundred, something like that. But even the corrective action will not be that significant. I sort of like to make the comparison to gold when it goes over a thousand to what happened with the Dow when it finally went over a thousand in nineteen eighty three. The Dow just kept on climbing, and I basically expect the same thing to happen for uh, for gold, principally because it'll be like an international buy signal. You know, when gold goes over a thousand, that'll be a worldwide event. And even if people don't understand why gold is moving the way it is, they'll be buying it. And that's going to create a lot of demand and buying power to send gold much higher. Regarding the U.S. dollar index, you remarked, quote, we can see from the above chart how the U.S. dollar index has been slipping. The bear market rally that began last year has ended. More to the point, it looks like the long-term downtrend in the dollar index is resuming. The dollar index closed Friday at 78.75, not far above its low of 78.40 made in June. Watch this June low. If the dollar index makes a new low, I expect the dollar's decline to accelerate rapidly. A collapse in the dollar may prove to be the spark that sends gold higher and over $1,000 per ounce. What about the U.S. dollar index? Where do you see it headed as an index, James? And I'm talking about over time. What, what do you see happening there? In the near term, the U.S. dollar index is going to go, I think, much lower. You'll see a knee-jerk reaction, people put, pulling money out of the dollar and putting it into gold and putting it into other currencies as well. But the real issue in my mind is as the dollar heads lower, um, I think the gravitational pull as the dollar goes into a black hole will pull the other currencies with it. So you won't necessarily see a, a big dramatic decline in the dollar index because all currencies will be heading lower relative to gold. In other words, the gold price will be soaring in terms of all the major, world's, uh, major world currencies. So on the dollar index, just so that I understand, you're, you're talking about really global competitive currency devaluations, which we are in fact seeing. But is the dollar index, I mean, or the U.S. dollar itself, do you see that going into oblivion or, or there being hyperinflation you know, versus the dollar when you talk about gold? What are we talking about with the dollar index? Meaning, will the U.S. dollar survive? Uh, you know, as John and I laid out in our book, The Collapse of the Dollar, we do expect the dollar to be destroyed just like the United States' first currency, which was the continental. Um, and one of the reasons why the framers created a, uh, the Constitution and a more perfect union was to create sound money. And so it was for you know 180 years until we abandoned uh, the gold standard in 1971 and abandoned the wisdom of the framers. So I think the dollar will go the way of the continental. And the thing that's going to drive it is the same thing that killed the continental and every other fiat currency. Too much government spending leading to too much government borrowing, and that borrowing is then turned into currency by the central bank. So hyperinflation, I think, is, is where we're headed. But keep in mind when we talk about hyperinflation, there are two specific kinds. You have paper currency hyperinflation like occurred in Weimar, Germany in the 1920s or is occurring uh, uh, recently in, in Zimbabwe. And then you have deposit currency hyperinflation like occurred in Latin America, Brazil, and Argentina. Um, in the 1980s and early 1990s. And the hyperinflation we're going to have in the States will be deposit currency hyperinflation. And the distinction between the two types of currency depends on the nature of the banking system in the country. In Germany in 1920 and in Zimbabwe, very few people had bank accounts, and most commerce was conducted by moving paper around hand-to-hand. -hand. In Brazil and in Argentina uh, in the 80s and 90s, everyone had bank accounts and very uh, little transaction were, transactions were done, uh, very few transactions were done by paper currency. 
So you had deposit currency hyperinflation, and that's what the Federal Reserve is doing. By buying federal government debt and putting uh, bookkeeping units in the government's checking account, we're on the road to a deposit currency hyperinflation. And commodity prices are starting to rise now, not because of good economic conditions, but because people are abandoning the dollar. That's one reason why we're seeing the dollar index back at its lows. When you talk about the continental in the United States, and and then it will go the way of the continental, what about because we had in the Civil War, obviously the losing side was the Confederacy, and so their Confederate notes went to zero. But but what about the greenback? I mean, that went into oblivion also, right? So this has happened a couple of times in the United States already, has it not? That's right. But it, what happened uh, with the greenback is uh, uh, Congress saw the folly of their ways. Uh, and there was a Supreme Court decision by um, uh, Salmon Chase, who was Lincoln's Treasury Secretary. Subsequently, when he was made the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, he said what he did as Treasury Secretary for uh, Lincoln was unconstitutional by creating a fiat paper currency. That subsequently was overturned by another Supreme Court. Uh, but, you know, it's quite clear the understanding at the time and just by reading the Constitution that fiat paper currency, um, it, you know, is unconstitutional. But the point is, is that the greenback was eventually returned back to the dollar. Um, uh, the, the Resumption Act of uh, uh, 1879, it took 10 years from 19, 1869 to 19, uh, 1879, but they eventually returned paper currency back to redeemable um, uh, into, into, into silver it was at the time rather than gold. When you look or you talk about the Federal Reserve and their control of the printing of U.S. dollars, is Jim Rogers right when he says that the Fed is immoral and should it be abolished? Or what, what is your view on that? I'm just curious, James. Yeah, I think Ron Paul um, and his legislation to end the Fed is the right way to go. Um, there's too much power created when you have the ability to create money out of thin air, and that's essentially what the Federal, uh, what the Federal Reserve is doing. You know, we hear all kinds of platitudes from the Federal Reserve that they're doing this and they're acting to prevent inflation, et cetera. But if you look at their historical track record, uh, you know, the dollar since the Federal Reserve was created in 1913 purchases only 2% of what a 1913 dollar purchased. They're constantly inflating away uh, the purchasing power of the dollar. Uh, And the Federal Reserve's purpose is not to preserve the purchasing power of the dollar. It's to continue to fund the federal budget deficits. Make sure that the U.S. government has all the money it wants to spend. And, you know, that's essentially why we've got big government today. Uh, The central bank is basically creating the money that the federal government is spending. And most Americans, according to the polls, think that we're on the wrong road. And I'm of of that point of view that we are on the wrong road. We have to go back to what the Constitution basically says, that the federal government is there not to try to solve all of our problems, but 17 enumerated powers Uh, and basically let uh, individuals uh, get on with their lives. When you go back, because I talked to Jim Grant about this, but the the gold currency essentially that we had in the 1880s, and you look at somebody would save money and maybe grab it a couple of decades later, wasn't it worth, James, I mean, maybe the money had fluctuated a little bit, wasn't it essentially worth what it was a couple of decades earlier if you had stashed something in the 1880s and you grabbed it in 1905? I mean, I'm sure there had been a little inflation, but but there wasn't this insidious, because if you do that now, it's it's not that your money's worthless, it's just worth a lot less, right? So that that gets back to that, the insidiousness of inflation and the system we're under being, you know, almost immoral, I guess. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And you're raising a very good point. Um, What we have to do is we have to calculate the prices of goods and services, not only in terms of dollars, but also in terms of of gold and in terms of silver to see what's really happening to the purchasing power of the dollar. Um, You know, an ounce of gold still buys the same amount of crude oil it did 50 years ago. It's preserved purchasing power over that period of time. That's why gold is money. It preserves purchasing power, and it's very useful in economic calculation, in other words, determining the prices of goods and services. I don't see gold as an investment. If you call gold an investment, you're going down the wrong road. Uh, And that's that gold doesn't purchase more crude oil than it did 50 years ago. It purchases the same amount. Who wants an investment that doesn't return anything over a 50-year period of time? But you clearly want money that does that. That's why, you know, when you buy gold, you should be viewing it it as you're saving sound money. Uh, You're not saving depreciating fiat currency. You're preserving that purchasing power when you want to need it. When you need it or uh, you want to use it at some future date.
But there are these period of times, James, like we're in right now, where, you know, in the 70s was another example where you have to almost take what's a dollar today and try to make it a dollar tomorrow, correct? So isn't that what you're talking about? Basically, by people going into gold, they can 